again, everybody. Uh, this is Tom Sheehan from Northeastern University and the NSF-sponsored SAGE, Sustainable Adaptive Radiance in the Coastal Environment Network. And we're pleased that you've joined us for today's uh, installment for the fall webinar series. We're having Dr. Ariana Sutton Grew with us to speak. Um, Dr. Sutton is an ecosystem ecologist with expertise in wetland ecology and restoration, biodiversity, Biochemistry, climate change, and ecosystem services. There is a research faculty member at the University of Maryland in the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center, and is also an ecosystem science advisor for the National Ocean Service at NOAA. She achieved her BS at Oregon State and did her graduate work at the university. Today she's going to be speaking about global ch climate change impacts on co and ocean ecosystem services and human health and can do about it. And we'll turn it over to Dr. Sutton Greer for today's webinar. Arana? Thank you. Uh, I want to start first saying um, I, I've gotten a cold. I apologize if I sound weird or if I have to blow my nose during this. I will try not to have to blow my nose. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation to, um, to present today. This is these topics near and dear to my heart and uh, related to my research and my uh, science policy work here at NOAA. I'm excited to get us to talk about all of this day. And, and you'll note from my title that uh, although there are a lot of global change impacts that I'm going to talk about, which can be somewhat disheartening, I'm going to end with what we can be doing about it because I think it's really important that people know that there are actions they can be taking in their own lives. and um, in order to improve the situation. So, uh, without further ado, let's get going. So, in light of recent events here in the United States, um, I have decided to start my talk today with a statement about climate change. So, I want to make it clear that as a scientist, I don't believe climate change is happening. I know it is happening. Climate change is a fact. It's supported by reams of data and evidence. Um, and it's happening now, and I'm going to be talking about that today. Um, so climate change, right, this picture to me really shows what's so important to be thinking about climate change and global change in general. So here's our planet, an absolutely gorgeous photo from NASA, and you see just a, a bare halo around this beautiful planet. That is our atmosphere, and it is very tiny in comparison to the size of the planet, and that is what is protecting this planet and making it a livable environment, the only one we know of so far in, the, in, in space, and, um, and that is what we are affecting with climate change. So it's that, that halo of gases around our planet that is protecting us, and that's where we're spewing ex excess CO2, carbon dioxide, that is causing our issues with climate change. So um, as we're thinking about this, you know, keep in mind that, again, I know climate change is happening because the vast majority of scientists are in agreement. The data support climate change is happening. Many of us have moved on to understanding the impacts of what climate change is likely to be doing. We're, we're stuck on is it happening. We've moved way beyond that to, well, what does this mean now and into the future? So, for example, a recent study in Nature Climate Change that was trying to examine, well, what, what does uh, sea level rise by the year 2100, what does that mean for the U.S. coastline and coastal populations? And they developed the Coastal Hazard Index. This is some of my colleagues, including Katie Arkema. And what you see here is where it's red, that's the highest coastal hazard index. So that's where people, populations will be most at threat of flooding due to sea level rise. And so you see mostly that that's on, along the northeast coast and in the Gulf. Now, interestingly, in this paper, they really wanted to ask the question, what role do natural coastal habitats play in providing protection to coastal communities? So the bar graph you see in the middle shows the population that's at risk in each state. And what you see in the black bars is with coastal habitats intact, this is who's at risk. And then the white bars show without habitat. So if we were to lose those coastal habitats to development, for, for example. 
And what you see is that in, in basically every case, um, or, or most cases, there's a lot of the population is being protected by coastal habitats, and that if we lose those coastal habitats, there's a much greater number of people at risk from sea level rise. So coming back to this point, uh, later in my talk, to talk about the importance of natural infrastructure and healthy coastal ecosystems for promoting coastal resilience. And in addition to future impacts, we're already seeing impacts of climate change right now. So this recent study by my colleague Bob Kopp and, and others says that we can already show that there are, there's more nuisance flooding happening due to human emissions um, that, are, that are changing the climate. So they were able to show that about three quarters of coastal flood days along the Atlantic are due to human emissions and that there's this accelerated rise in sea level due to the emissions from uh, climate change or global warming. And so this is leading to nuisance flooding. So this isn't flooding from a big storm event and extreme weather, which I'm going to be talking more about, but this is just a, a daily high tide that is starting to cause more regular flooding. And this is only going to get worse because the study suggests that we can expect another three to four feet of sea level rise by the end of the 21st century. So again, climate change is happening already. We're already feeling some of those effects, and the effects are going to get worse. So today, I actually want to talk about not just climate change, but five different coastal stressors that are in coastal and marine ecosystems, and uh, how that's affecting and degrading ecosystems and the ecosystem services or the benefits we get from those coastal ecosystems, and then the resulting impacts on human health and well-being. So let's dive right in. I'm going to cover five stressors today. We're going to talk about raising temperatures, we'll talk about nutrient pollution and how, and, and how that relates to harmful algal blooms and hypoxia. We're going to talk about ocean acidification, uh, at destruction and loss of biodiversity, and also extreme weather events. And show you this is what a general. I'm going to show you this framework several times with a stressor on the left, how it's impacting ecosystem services, and then what the impacts on human health are because of that loss or change in ecosystem services. So looking first at rising temperatures, um, this is from some work in Nature Climate Change from 2012 where we are already finding that there are changes in the distribution, the phenology, and the productivity of our fisheries. So there's some evidence that uh, we might be seeing a reduction in body size as well. And the reasoning for this is that there's less dissolved oxygen in the warmer water. And as a result, average body size could actually contract by 24% by 2050 for many species. We're also seeing changes in distributions where tropical fish are moving northward toward cooler water, uh, but this is causing some changes in species assemblages, and uh, you know we don't really know what the impacts of that could be for fishery productivity into the future. But we do know that fish protein is, is very important for many people around the world. It's a, it's a significant part of their diet, so this could have important implications. All right, other things about rising temperature that are um, affecting coastal ecosystems. So many of you may have heard about coral bleaching. This is a really beautiful graphic we put together. No, it was coral um, con reef conservation program. So let's just talk through what, what happens with coral bleaching. So in a healthy coral, which you see on the left, uh, the coral and the algae live together in a symbiotic relationship, and they depend on each other. Corals become stressed. And one of the ways that they can become stressed is with higher temperatures. Uh, they can also become stressed due to pollution. But when they become stressed, the algae leave the corals. And so this creates that bleached white coral look that you've probably seen in some pictures, and I have some pictures coming up. The bleached coral isn't dead, but it is greatly weakened and vulnerable so that it becomes more susceptible to disease. And, and so this is really a problem. So here you see images from uh, the Great Barrier Reef which has been experiencing some massive bleaching events, and this is what it looks like. And the bottom graphic is from American Samoa, um, where you're seeing a progression from a healthy reef to an, a, a bleaching event that occurred so that the, the reef is vulnerable, it's bleached. And by August of 2015, on the right panel, you see that the coral had died. It had not been able to recover from the bleaching event. And this is happening more and more. 
So we are losing coral ecosystems due to rising temperatures of coastal waters. Factor related to rising temperatures. So Vibrio is, Vibrios are a bacteria and they can cause illness and they cause about 100 deaths in the U.S. each year. Uh, they tend to, they're typically found in warm and salty coastal waters um, or river estuaries. And people usually pick up the, the bacteria through the consumption of raw or undercooked seafood, but we can, uh, like oysters for example, we can also get it by if we have a cut in our skin and then we're out swimming in the ocean, we can get infected that way. And what we're seeing, and, and there's been some scientific evidence building about this for a while, but there was a, a recent paper out just this past summer, we're seeing more outbreaks of rio caused disease and including for the first time in Alaska, which was an extension in the Vibrio range of about 1,000 kilometer, kilometers that had never been seen in Alaska before. And here's from that recent paper I mentioned. So you're seeing on the top panel, Northern Europe, and on the bottom panel, the uh, U.S. Atlantic coast, and, and it starts back in the 70s for Northern Europe and the 90s for the U.S. And basically what you're seeing is an increase in the number of cases of Vibrio-caused disease, such that it's about two to three times uh, an increase in the number of cases we're seeing, and this correlates with increased temperatures we're seeing. Um, we're seeing more cases in areas experiencing more warming, such as Northern Europe. So this is definitely another issue facing us with rising temperatures of our coastal environments, really of all of our environments, but definitely of our coastal environments. So here's the stressor, rising temperature. The kinds of causes, the kinds of changes it's causing in ecosystems and ecosystem services, is we're seeing things like decreases in average fish biomass, Increases in disease and pest population abundance, as well as their geographic distribution, and again, changes in that species distribution. So, what's present where for harvesting, or where diseases or vectors are able to survive, is changing. And in terms of impacts on human health, this lead to uh, less seafood biomass, changes in species distribution. This means less food security, perhaps um, less food diversity. Uh, this can have impacts, obviously, through uh, job security, but also food security for, for people who are dependent on fisheries for uh, either their jobs or their, their protein. We're also seeing more disease exposure, so we're seeing increased cases of, of the Vibrios, as, as mentioned. And then, of course, people living in coastal environments also are experiencing the rising temperatures, so there can be more heat stress. And I want to couch this all in terms of, um, you know, at the, at the moment, uh, there are 9 million tons of fish harvested from the wild each year. That's a statistic from 2014. And fish provide about 3.1 billion people with about 20% of their intake of animal protein each year. So this really is these changes that are occurring and are likely to continue to occur in, in food availability and productivity really could have very substantial impacts on food security issues for a, a huge chunk of the world's population. All right. Moving to the second topic, nutrient pollution. So both hypoxia and harmful algal blooms, which you may refer to as HABs, are a growing problem worldwide. And this eutrophication or nutrient pollution leads to hypoxia and in some cases can increase the occurrence of HABs. So I'm going to talk about both of these. And other animal uh, health risks can result from exposure to these events uh, and they occur. And these, this can have significant economic losses. So the distribution of HABs in the United States, and then I want to point out that there are many kinds of HABs, which you're seeing here with the different colors. That's not necessarily particularly important. What I really want you to see is that there are basically HABs around the U.S. So harmful algal blooms are occurring broadly, including in uh, Alaska and Hawaii and on our coast, and some of our internal waterways as well. When these have events occur, this is an example in Texas in the western Gulf of Mexico where there was a Texas red tide. You can see Padre Island National Seashore there on the left. They had to close the park. The dogs, because, and, and, and really uh, to many people too, because of all the fish kills. The fish were, were washing up on the shore and then if they got eaten by a, a dog, that could result actually in the deaths of people's pets. It obviously isn't good for wildlife if we have lots of fish dying, and then obviously um, if any birds or other animals eat the, the fish that have been sickened of this, this can result in wildlife kills as well. 
And I actually experienced a HAB event in Texas a few years ago. You see the person on the right wearing a mask. Um, I tried to walk down on the beach and the, the toxin was so strong in the air that I started to have trouble breathing and my eyes were watering and it was very uncomfortable. So even though I was only in Texas for a couple of days and really wanted to go to the Gulf of Mexico and, and be on the beach, I didn't get to because there was a, a red tide event happening right then. So uh, this affects uh, humans and wildlife and pets, etc. In terms of climate change, um, there's some evidence that climate change is going to have, is, is creating the right conditions so that we may experience more har harmful algal blooms. Uh, we're already seeing some evidence, as, as seen here in the panel on the right, where warming temperatures are getting to an increase in the frequency, duration, and also geographic extent of HABs, which is what you can see. You're seeing the season is extending farther. We're seeing events now um, in June and in November, whereas we didn't really used to see many of those events. And by 2080s, um, you know, we've seen an extension even earlier into the spring. Um, and so really, we are creating conditions that are likely to make HABs just an ongoing problem into the future. The hypoxia, this is an increasing global problem. You can see in the bar graph on, on the bottom. In the early 1900s, we had very few of these events. Now we're, we're having hundreds of events worldwide, greater than 400 system reporting hypoxia, and that was just as of 2007. So definitely a growing problem. In the United States, the three largest hypoxic zones are in the Gulf of Mexico, Chesapeake Bay, and Lake Erie. And you have this kind of an event, what happens is you have a whole bunch of excess nutrients. So eutrophication, that is, these nutrients are washing into the waterways. They stimulate productivity um, in the, in, in the uh, phytoplankton in these waters. Uh, and then that phytoplankton dies and starts to decompose. And it will get decomposed. And the decomposition actually uses up the oxygen in the water. But then you get these areas where there's very low to no dissolved oxygen in the water. And that makes those areas uninhabitable by all the other animals in the water column. So all the other organisms are dependent on the dissolved oxygen. So fish and shrimp and dolphins and everything are dependent on there being dissolved oxygen in the water. So that's why these hypoxic zones are such a big deal. So looking at the relationship between nutrient pollution, ecosystem services, and human health, we see that nutrient pollution is leading to decreases in clean drinking water. You see that in the picture on the bottom there, where these blooms can just totally gum up water uh, facilities for municipalities. It leads to decreases in safe seafood. Um, and then air quality issues, as I mentioned from my experience in Texas, where you could be on the beach because you couldn't breathe. So this is impacting coastal radiation opportunities. We're seeing increases in fish and wildlife kills and then also susceptibility to other diseases when uh, animals are weakened by these events. So in terms of impacts on human health, this gave to problems with lack of clean drinking water. This has actually been an issue in the Great Lakes the past couple of summers where they have had times where there have been issues with not being able to take in enough water for specific municipalities in the Great Lakes. You have an impaired quality of seafood, uh, so you may or may not be able to eat the shellfish, but if a HAB event is occurring, you definitely should not be eating the shellfish in an area, and you may sometimes see closure for part of a season or a whole season. This obviously affects job security and stress for those living in coastal environments. Um, if you can't go and use recreational areas, many of us love to go to the beach because it's relaxing and enjoyable, but if the beaches are closed, that's not a problem. And I mean, that's a problem. And so we then have potentially more stress, less radiation, less ability to just de-stress, enjoy ourselves at, in, in coastal ecosystems. And then, of course, there's wildlife loss and risk to pets. And this can cause people mental health issues where they're worried about their pets or they're, they're really not happy seeing all of the dead fish, et cetera. So, so stress levels can be building. All right, moving to the third stressor, ocean acidification. This one is, again, related to climate change. So the first one was rising temperatures. That's related to climate change. Ocean, ocean acidification is also directly related to climate change. So when you hear about ocean acidification, I want to explain exactly what is happening there. 
So you have this buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide, um, just as a basic chemical property, will always be in equilibrium with water, or it, it's constantly dissolving so that there is an equilibrium with the water. So you get carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's dissolving into the water, which is that leftmost arrow. So O2 plus water forms carbonic acid. That is just the natural chemical reaction that occurs. In water, carbonic acid, then disassociates into a bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3, and a hydrogen ion, H+. So basically, this process is a basic chemical reaction. We can't stop it. We can't do anything about the fact that this is the basic chemical reaction. As we push more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, more and more will dissolve in the water, and more hydrogen ions, which is what causes acidity, will be in our ocean. So this is a direct result of climate change and of increasing CO2. So what does it mean? What is ocean acidification doing? Well, we're seeing that the oceans are 30% more acidic than pre-industrial levels already, and this has negative effects on corals and other calcifying coral reef species. And so you see at the bottom what a healthy reef looks like on the left, and then a reef where we're at 450 to 500 parts per million CO2, and a reef where it's over 500 parts per million. Um, and you can see there's a decrease in the health of the reef, there's a decrease in diversity, um, and it's not a very healthy reef there on the right. So this threatens numerous ecosystem services that we get from reefs, like the fisheries that are dependent on the reef, the ecotourism from um, everyone wanting to go and snorkel and dive and see reefs. It also decreases the coastal protection for communities because coral reefs provide wave reduction and, and energy reduction, wave energy reduction. And we actually get a lot of natural products and a lot of drug discovery that's happened from reef ecosystems. So obviously we lose the potential for that, for those products and drugs and, and other benefits as we lose our coral reefs. This is an issue for edible mollusks uh, that exhibit overall negative responses to ocean acidification. Now this is, every species is a little bit different, so this isn't necessarily meaning that every species will be negatively impacted, but in general, many species of mollusks and corals um, have negative responses to acidification. So again, this threatens the availability and the economic benefits we, that we depend on from seafood, and particularly for people or communities which rely heavily on bile for protein or for their livelihood. This puts them in an especially vulnerable position. I want to give one example um, from, from the Pacific Northwest. So this can really have major economic impact. So in the mid-2000s, um, the oyster hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest were experiencing near collapse. They were having almost none of their oyster spat, which is the teeny tiny little oyster seeds. Um, they were, almost none of them were surviving. And this $84 million industry with 3,000 jobs in the Pacific Northwest, working together with scientists from both academia and NOAA. Uh, they determined that the acidic water was actually killing the oyster larva, and they've been able to develop a program where they can monitor the seawater so that the hatcheries can schedule the production when the seawater is less acidic. They can also choose to shut off water intakes from the coast if the, if the water becomes too acidic. So this is a success story where they've come up with a way to sort of adapt to the ocean acidification conditions that were causing a problem. If water continued to get lots more acidic, there would be there would there might be shorter and shorter windows when there would even be water available for supporting those hatcheries. And obviously, for oysters and shellfish and other organisms living in the water that that aren't in the hatcheries, they can't run away from ocean acidification. They have to deal with it daily, and and that can can cause real problems for survival of other species. So, looking at the relationship between ocean acidification and system services and human health, what we're seeing is that already seeing decreases in some cases in shellfish production and in coral reef production and area due to ocean acidification, as well as to the bleaching event that we talked about with rising temperatures. Corals are really getting hit with a double whammy in many places. This leads to decreases in nursery habitat for other species, uh, a decrease in the resilience of these communities to other stressors like extreme weather or nutrient pollution or overfishing. Obviously, we're losing the aesthetics of these reefs and the ecotourism opportunities. And so in terms of impacts on human health, uh, this is leading to the potential for fewer coastal jobs, 
um, both in fisheries and in tourism, potential stress from unemployment or depressed coastal economies. This also uh, is having some impact in some places on, on seafood and will probably have more impacts into the future. So again, less food security and food diversity. Um, and then fewer um, or decreased opportunities for relaxation and, and ecotourism, which can lead to decreases in uh, mental health for people. So the fourth factor I wanted to discuss is habitat destruction. Um, and so basically, coastal habitats are some of the most threatened ecosystems in the world. And they're threatened primarily by loss to either sea level rise or to coastal development for agriculture or for hotels and recreation, et cetera. So this leads to a loss of biodiversity and a loss of many ecosystem services. And so I want to mention some of the main ecosystem services that we get from some of these um, really important coastal habitats. So oysteries, for example, are important, obviously, for seafood. They also provide really important filtration services, helping to keep water quality and um, improved in our estuaries. They provide shoreline protection and stabilization. Um, they all provide uh, nutrient cycling and, and opportunities for aesthetics and recreation, not to mention science and education um, opportunities. Of course, we've already talked about this to some degree, but they provide food and medicinal and ornamental and other products. They provide very important nursery habitat and refuge habitat for a lot of species, including a number of our recreational and commercial fisheries. They provide very important aesthetic and recreational and tourism opportunities, as well as cultural and spiritual values for, for communities who have lived with coral reefs uh, as part of their culture. Um, they provide shoreline protection as well, and again, science and education opportunities. Dunes and beaches provide, obviously, aesthetics and recreational opportunities that many of us like to partake in. Provide shoreline protection and stabilization. Uh, very important shoreline protection and stabilization. They also are very important to soil and sediment balance, water quality, again, science and education opportunities. So these are the kinds of things that we stand to lose as we lose coastal habitat. So we have decreases potentially in um, storm surge risk reduction and shoreline stabilization decreases potentially in sea abundance, changes in the nutrient balance, decreases in aesthetics and recreation opportunities and education opportunities, decreases basically in resilience of these ecosystems to other stressors, and loss of biodiversity. And then impacts on human health, and some of these are probably starting to sound pretty familiar, uh, but we have less climate adaptation opportunities, uh, opportunity if we have lost that storm protection, so we have a bigger risk of the property and livelihoods and lives. Less food can mean fewer jobs and less few food security. We can have issues with water quality and clean drinking water along our coasts, which obviously have major health risks for people and wildlife. Um, fewer and decreased opportunities for recreation, which can impact mental health. So then extreme weather is the last one I want to discuss today. And, and here you're seeing storm damage to coastal habitats and coastal communities. Um, and as we have a loss of coastal habitats, this, is, this creates a loss of future storm surge protection. The picture you're seeing on the left is from the tsunami in Japan. So storm damage to human infrastructure also occurs uh, as we lose, as we have sea level rise and as we have extreme events, so that flooding is more severe. This can lead to uh, leaking of pollution and waste and leading to water contamination when these events occur. This is in addition to loss of property, loss of lives, loss of livelihoods. So then we can have, because of these events, decreases in water quality, decreases in seafood safety. What you're seeing in the bottom picture are tuna that could not be eaten because of radiation from the um, tsunami-damaged Fukushima nuclear power plant. Um, so really a complete waste of wonderful seafood if it becomes contaminated by radiation or sewage. Uh, we also then have losses of wildlife and, again, loss of recreational opportunities. Um, and here's a picture um, many of you are probably very familiar with some devastation after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this was Long Beach, New York, where you see major impacts on those coastal buildings and coastal infrastructure um, for people living in Long Beach, New York. So the relationship between extreme weather and ecosystem services and human health, we have changes in uh, decreases in clean water, uh, decreases in safe seafood when these events occur and leaks and pollution occur. Um, we have decreases in storm surge protection as these events sometimes devastate uh, coastal ecosystems. If they aren't restored, uh, we lose that protection from future events. 
Um, we have decreases in coastal aesthetics and recreational opportunities and honestly decreases in, in human habitat opportunities at the coast as well. So in impacts on human health, this can affect clean drinking water supply. Uh, we can have impaired quality of seafood with all the impacts to jobs and uh, seafood safety and, and food security. We can have and decrease opportunities for coastal recreation and relaxation. This can lead to changes in stress and anxiety and decreases in mental health. So I want to mention a lot of this was published in a paper with my colleague Paul Sandifer. And so you can see that citation at the bottom. This was in 2014 in Natural Resources Forum. And if anyone wants any of the papers that I mention in this presentation, you can feel free to email me. My email is at the end on the last slide. Some of that can be pretty depressing, which is why I wanted to try to end on um, somewhat of a more positive note of what can we do? What can we be doing about all of this? And I really feel as if society is at a point where we have to make choices about the future of our planet and the future of our coast. And there are things we can be doing, but we all need to be doing them, and we need to be doing them right away. So the first thing is we all need to be limiting greenhouse gas emissions. And this means absolutely in a personal way in your daily life, but it also means as a country and as a planet, um, all the countries in the world need to be working on this. So it's really important that we reach out and tell our representatives that the U.S. has to stick to its climate mitigation commitments from the Paris meeting last year. Um, our president-elect has said that he doesn't necessarily believe in climate change. Again, this is why I think it's really important not to be talking with language saying believe in climate change. It is not a belief. The way religion is a belief, this is science, this is evidence-based fact that climate change is happening, and we all must stick to our commitments from this agreement. So reaching out to your representatives to let them know that that's important to you is really important. We need to be educating others. Again, we need to talk about climate change as something that's a fact, it's happening, and talking about the impacts that are already being felt by coastal communities and others. We invest in wind and solar and clean energy as much as we can in our own lives and in our businesses and, and be talking to others about that opportunity. We carbon offsets to reduce our footprint. We do have a national greenhouse gas mitigation market at this point, but we do have voluntary market opportunities. There are lots of ways to be buying carbon offsets to be helping to reduce our emissions. And relatively to some of my work here at NOAA, we are restoring and protecting coastal wetland blue carbon ecosystems. So what you're seeing here in this figure is a wind up in Massachusetts at Coit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, that deep brown soil is really organic, carbon-rich soil. And these ecosystems are incredibly efficient natural carbon sinks. They are sequestering carbon for the long term. Many of these ecosystems have been sequestering carbon for hundreds or thousands of years. These soils tend to be many meters thick in some cases. are very carbon-rich. So if we can protect the existing wetlands, coastal ones, and here I'm talking about marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses, and we can restore them where possible, then we can be making sure we protect and even increase this natural greenhouse gas sink, which is another way of working on mitigating climate change. Um, so supporting organizations that are trying to do this work is really important. Places like um, Conservation International, Restore America's Estuaries, the Nature Conservancy, these are all organizations working very hard to protect wetland, coastal blue carbon ecosystems. Another thing we can be doing, we can be protecting and restoring coastal natural infrastructure. I mentioned this early in the talk. When we think about coastal resilience and protecting people from flooding, what we typically have historically thought about is our gray or built infrastructure. These options for seawalls and riprap, levees and dikes. Um, but there are other options that provide a whole suite of co-benefits. And that's what we mean when we say natural infrastructure. So marshes and coral reefs, mangroves, oyster reefs, dunes and beaches, all of these ecosystems provide wave energy reduction. And so as a result, re they reduce the risk of storm and erosion problems for coast communities. So natural infrastructure, what do we mean when we say that? Let's, let's take this community. We wanted to increase, in my hypothetical example here, wanted to increase its coastal resilience. 
you can stack natural infrastructure opportunities. So this community said, gosh, we want to restore our barrier island. It got hammered by that last storm, and we want to restore it so it's back out there in the water. And then we also want to restore oyster beds and salt marsh that used to exist here, but that have become degraded. So here there's that triple layer of natural defense. And the benefits of using natural infrastructure is that these systems can actually strengthen with time. If you restore a system, it grows stronger with time, whereas built infrastructure tends to grow weaker with time. It's, it always is designed with a lifespan in mind, and it doesn't last forever. These natural systems can be self-maintaining, and they have the potential for self-repair after storms. They can grow and keep pace with sea level rise in many cases. They can, in some cases, be more cost-effective. And one of the things I think is really important about these systems is they provide a whole bunch of co-benefits, things like habitat for key commercial or recreational fisheries or for birds. They provide water quality. They can, as we mentioned, sometimes provide carbon sequestration uh, for in the long term. And they provide all those co-benefits. They're providing all those co-benefits all the time. And then they provide the storm risk reduction benefits when a storm is approaching whereas traditional built approaches only provide that storm protection benefit, and they only provide it when a storm is approaching. In my work that's cited at the bottom um, on natural infrastructure, I also discovered with my colleagues a bunch of hybrid approaches, which are really exciting, where you combine some natural coastal resilience features with built features. So in this example, a community decided to do the ecosystem restoration I talked about, but in addition, they moved some homes away, they built some homes up on stilts, and they put in an operable floodgate that can close when a storm is approaching. So this kind of hybrid approach really is on the strengths of both green and gray infrastructure. And, and uh, you can use gray to protect green as it establishes. You can use the green infrastructure to protect the gray, which helps to extend the lifetime or reduces the, um, the cost of building it because you don't have to build as big a gray infrastructure structure if you have natural infrastructure um, to provide some storm protection as well. So an example of hybrid infrastructure, this is, this is what's called living shorelines. Living shorelines use a combination of both habitat restoration and some kind of built features to provide protection from erosion and storms. And what you're seeing in these pictures is um, before the, the living shoreline was introduced and then after it was introduced. And this is a project at a NOAA facility on Pivers Island in Beaufort, North Carolina. The beach was eroding, and so they used marsh creation, and they also used a built oyster sill, oysters that were recovered from bulkheads on the site, um, in order to create this living shoreline. And this was uh, instead of putting in a seawall. Um, so it provides a, a bunch of co-benefits, uh, co including some habitat, and they didn't need to put in a seawall. So one of the other examples of hybrid uh, opportunities for coastal resilience that I get really excited about is the Real by Design competition that was run uh, in New York and New, and New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy. And so this is one of the winning projects from that Rebuild by Design competition. It was called the Big U. And the whole idea was that it would use a combination of hard and soft infrastructure, or built and green, um, with, but also with a focus on recreational benefits. So this was one of the winning projects. They didn't get enough money to fully implement everything yet, but they got enough to begin implementation of what they are calling the East Side Coastal Resilience Project, pictured here. And here they're really trying to integrate flood protection into their community, and at the same time they are improving water access for down Manhattan. What I think is so exciting about this project and many of the other Rebuild by Design projects is that after Hurricane Sandy, the reaction of the community could have been protect, build a seawall. We don't want to have that flooding again. We don't want to be at risk. And instead, the reaction of many of these communities has been, no, we are a coastal community. We want to be connected to our coast. We want to still be connected to the water, but we also want increased coastal resilience. We don't want to be flooded next time. And so this project is using a combination of berms and flood walls, natural features, and built barriers to provide that flooding protection, but also to actually increase the ability of the community to access the water and, and do creation right along the waterfront. So it's kind of innovation that gets me really excited about where we can go with our coastal resilience uh, in the future. Okay, third thing we can be doing is um, to continue research to understand ecosystem services. 
diagnosis. We need to monitor conditions. Uh, we need to be able to avoid peak negative conditions as was happening in, uh, as continues to happen in Washington State where they're really watching uh, how to make sure the oyster hatcheries can survive no matter, uh, no, no, no matter what the ocean conditions are in terms of ocean acidification. Uh, we have the coral reef watch here at NOAA where we try to have a better understanding of where the biggest risks of bleaching are likely to occur every year with the hope that we can try it, at least in some cases, to mitigate the impacts of some of these uh, stressors that are occurring, better understand which services we care about and how to protect those services. We need to really be thinking about, as we better understand how these stressors are likely to impact systems, we need to be doing research and planning for the future. Um, and here's an example of thinking about coastal adaptation. This is a very recent paper by uh, some of my colleagues and basically took a look along the Gulf and said, you know, with sea level rise, where can we anticipate that salt marshes or tidal marshes might be moving as sea level rises? And they found that there were four different cases, one where the ecosystem at the top, you're seeing that the ecosystem could move inland, one with some kind of a, a, a geomorphology constraint, so they can't move inland because of topography largely. And then there were cases where human development was either in the way or could potentially be in the way in the future. And so they mapped this out. And what you're seeing on the left is a picture of where inland migration of coastal, uh, coastal ecosystems is, is likely to be possible with the darker blue showing where there's more possibility of moving those ecosystems inland. All right, what I think is really important to look at is here looked at landward migration that is likely to be prevented not by current urban um, environments, but by future urban environments. So they looked at where, where in the Gulf are cities likely to expand and is there, where are there already plans to expand them or it's part of the, the plan for the, for the 21st century? And where is that going to be in conflict with the ability of coastal ecosystems to move inland? And so this is highlighting where we have the biggest policy opportunity right now to say, hey, if we want to make sure that in the future we still have as much coastal habitat and as many coastal ecosystems as we possibly can because of all those important ecosystem services they provide, then we need to be targeting those places where there's a lot of future urban development plans, but where there's also real possibility for ecosystems to move inland. And if we can be forward thinking like this in our policies right now, people in the future will benefit because we will not lose as much coastal habitat as sea level rises. These are the kinds of really important policy decisions and the way science can be supporting really good policy decisions right now. Okay, and the last point is that once we have this information, as I said, we need to be accounting for ecosystem services in policies and decision making. And, and here's some examples of where we're trying to do this. So as there's a, a bigger understanding of the, the protection provided by coastal ecosystems, uh, the federal government released the, this research needs for coastal green infrastructure. This is trying to say, here's the main research gaps we need to fill in order for our policies to better account for the benefits that these natural ecosystems provide. Uh, this is guidance in the middle for considering the use of living shorelines, so trying to provide um, and so that communities can more easily uh, um, choose to adopt living shorelines instead of seawalls. And then on the right, blue carbon solutions for climate change. This is again trying to look at leveraging those carbon benefits of coastal wetlands for coastal conservation and also for climate change mitigation. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that it can be really important to connect ecosystem conservation to other policy opportunities. You've heard me talk a lot about the human health impacts of changes in ecosystems today. And this is an example, I know it's quite a spaghetti diagram, um, I don't really need you to understand the details of this, but to our knowledge, this is some of the first work to really try to look at when a disaster occurs, like an oil spill or a hurricane, which you see along the bottom of this figure. That has impacts in terms of creating a stressor or a turf here on the ecosystem, which then has impacts on the ecosystems, which you see there in the middle that's called the state. And that impacts ecosystem services. It impacts the ability of the ecosystem to provide the benefits we care about, like clean water or fishing or tourism. 
Well, this then has direct and indirect impacts on human health and well-being. And it's that connection to human health and well-being of the changes in ecosystem services that is really unique to the research that um, I've been working on with Paul Sandifer and others um, in the Gulf, trying to better understand what is it we lose when these disasters occur. We tend to think about the direct impacts to human health. So, for example, the threat of breeding um, volatile organic compounds that come from an oil spill for example, but we don't think about all the indirect human impacts, uh, human health impacts in terms of increases in stress and increases in um, we do to either physiological stress or psychological health changes that occur because of stress about jobs or about one's community and, and the ability of one's community to survive. This is, a, a, this is brand new work that was funded by um, a National Academy of Sciences study in the Gulf. It was an exploratory grant and we have this paper in review right now. It's this kind of trying to connect what we get from ecosystems to other policy drivers like human health that I think, again, is really innovative and we need to be doing more of it so that we have more partners in terms of trying to fight these stressors um, in our coastal environment. And here's the last example I want to talk about, which is we really need to be designing science to inform policy. I've mentioned this already a couple of times, and here's another example from my own work with some colleagues um, where the interest in coastal wetland blue carbon, where uh, in this figure on the left, what you see is the red arrows represent the CO2 being taken up by the plants and then being stored in the, the soil, uh, which is what I showed in that beautiful picture of the salt marsh um, earlier. And so it's those red arrows that represent long-term carbon sequestration in the soils. Well, what has happened with this interest, uh, growing interest in wetlands for climate mitigation is that other coastal ecosystems, people said, well, what about corals? What about kelp? What about all these other uh, coastal ecosystems? Um, so this paper has been really important because the problem is many of those other ecosystems do not actually sequester carbon long term. What you're seeing here in this figure shows the carbon cycle in coral reefs. The carbon is taken up um, by the algae in, in corals, but most of that is then basically blown off through the respiration and decomposition of the coral's natural um, uh, metabolism. So the corals basically use the carbon that the algae fix. And um, the interesting thing is that the calcification process actually generates carbon dioxide instead of sequestering carbon. You see no red arrows in this figure. There is no carbon sequestration occurring in corals. So this paper, I think, is really important because we go through corals and a number of other coastal ecosystems, basically answering the question, why are we not talking about coral, corals when we talk about coastal blue carbon? Really, we need to be focusing on coastal wetlands as the best option for coastal climate mitigation because they are the ones that sequester carbon. So again, this is science very much targeted to informing policy. So what I want to end and say, you know, we know enough to be taking action today and it's really up to us, it's up to society. What do we want the future of our planet and the future of our coast to look like? I hope out of today you've gotten some good ideas for what you can be doing in your daily life and research and work in order to make a difference. And I am now happy to take questions, and if you'd like more information, there's my email and my website. Thank you. Ariane, there's a really great overview of, of so many of the drivers that are impacting the coastal ecosystems, which, which I think was great, great for, for us from different disciplines. So thanks for that. Um, as you imagine, we've got some questions that have to do with the political climate coming so I'm but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one non-political question first um, when, uh, I think it's from Elizabeth Hammond who leads the Seisha project that, uh, who and she is a planner so she she was asking the question what are the challenges with coastal wetlands and salt marshes and similar types of green infrastructure is that these is messy or less aesthetic to homeowners and, and to uh, authorities and, and others to the beach? Have you seen research or, or approaches that overcome this perception that uh, these, this green infrastructure is not aesthetically pleasing? 
Interesting. Um, the, some of the research I had seen, um, and some of it's more anecdotal maybe than, than others, but um, it's very interesting in the Chesapeake Bay anyway, where you find that people prefer to harden their own shoreline along their property. They like to have a bulkhead in, for example, or a small seawall. They really prefer to look across the way at a more natural environment. So they would really rather look at that island in the center than a nature reserve, but they still want on their own property their bulkhead for, for storm protection. So at least in some places, I think maybe it's cultural. You know, I think some, some people grow up and they really only visit the beach, and that's what they think of when they think coastal habitats. Other people grew up in places where the coast actually meant things like wetlands, et cetera. And, and so I haven't seen as much where it's like, like wetlands lose against beaches. Um, the other thing to know, though, is that you know, there, from an ecological standpoint, there's a right place to put different kinds of ecosystems. And you wouldn't necessarily want to put a salt marsh everywhere. It might be that a beach is more appropriate for um, particular storm protection opportunities. Um, so you really want to look at the ecological framing as well when you're trying to figure out what makes the most sense. Um, the other thing I think we just have to be potentially working on is uh, we may be fighting in, in some ways a little bit of an uphill battle with changing people's perceptions of what is beautiful, what is useful, and what provides co-benefits that we care about. Um, I definitely wouldn't want to pit, you know, beaches against wetlands. Um, but I think that, you know, if we do a better job of explaining what we get from these different services and that it's really important from the different ecosystem, sorry, and that it's really important that we get a diversity of services, they all provide some, some overlapping but some unique um, ecosystem services, that might help to start changing people's perception of, of what they think is important and what they want to see uh, in their own communities. Great. Um, there are a pair of questions that are actually related to the change in um, the, the, polit the politics uh, that are occurring in the U.S. Uh, the first, the first is it looks like that it's likely that there's going to be uh, a shift from admitting climate change is due to anthropogenic uh, in the next few years. And is whether, given that, do we stop talking about that, and maybe now there's some wiggle room to to have our deadlock and talk, talk about, about rather what's causing the change, maybe focus on mitigating the effects, which is a bit what your talk, certainly what your talk has been about. You know, when I talk um, to different audiences, I think very carefully about my audience before I uh, decide exactly what kind of language I want to use. And, and so, for example, with my work on blue carbon, um, if it's an audience that I think is not going to be as, uh, c c you know, climate change friendly, as in there are people who might not really want to discuss that or, or want to say, well, I don't believe in that or whatever, then I'm going to frame a lot of the discussion about the importance of coastal ecosystems less in terms of the climate mitigation potential that, you know, wetlands play, for example. So I'm not going to really talk as much about blue carbon. I'm going to instead focus a lot more on the fact that we're seeing nuisance flooding. This is already occurring, and this is not a red and blue state issue. Basically, every coastal state understands that flooding is becoming a bigger issue. Um, it's one of the topics that Congress can still agree about. I've actually been um, excited to present twice Capitol Hill about the importance of natural infrastructure, and both of those Hill briefings had um, staffers from Republican and Democratic um, uh, representatives. And I think that's really hopeful that there are spaces where we can come together and we can work on how do we solve these problems? What are our options on the table? Uh, how do we provide funding for these kinds of um, opportunities and, and projects? It, it doesn't always come cheap, but we really do need to be thinking about how do we protect coastal cities, um, coastal ecosystems. And I, I do think there's really space here that where we cross the aisle, this is not something where we have to be divided, want to talk about things like um, what's happening with flooding. So I absolutely agree with that. It, and, and it may be that we uh, downplay a little bit over the next few years uh, the coastal blue carbon role of, of coastal wetlands, and instead we hype their, their um, storm risk reduction benefits more. Um, 
but I think it's about audience. And, um, and so for me, I think very carefully about my audience and, and how I target my messaging so as not to alienate people from the get-go um, in hopes that we can form these partnerships and make progress no matter what is happening with the administration change and the transition, et cetera. The question is whether you've heard anything about uh, any sort of traction that the argument that I guess the DOD has put forward in the past, which is that there may be a national security issue related to climate refugees, and that that may be uh, kind of a toehold that will give kind of cover to a new administration to address uh, some climate change issues. Have you heard anything more about that particular argument? You know, I haven't heard anything specific to that in terms of the president-elect and, and transition. I can tell you that um, the Department of Defense has been very forward-thinking about climate change and the kind of impacts it could have on the U.S., on their own facilities, their coastal bases, uh, for example, and also on what that means for the world and, and exactly what you're mentioning, things like climate refugees. Um, I don't think they're going to change that thinking. They will continue to work on these issues because they know that they're going to happen no matter what the administration is currently thinking. So I don't know that it will make a lot of difference and traction in, in the administration, but I also am fairly sure that the Department of Defense will continue to work on these uh, issues because they know it is a pressing concern that, it, it, that they cannot ignore. So that's the interesting thing about the federal government is a transition to a new administration does come with some impacts to federal agencies and, and can impact budgets, et cetera, but there are also things and programs and efforts going on in federal agencies that continue no matter what is happening in, in, in the president's uh, branch. And, and so that, that's one thing I draw comfort in um, at the moment when, you know, uh, there may not be the kind of progress in some ways that we were hoping for with the federal government, but I know some stuff will keep moving. And I've actually been incredibly heartened by some of the stuff I've been seeing from the private sector with businesses really picking up and saying, you know what, we're going to keep working on this no matter what because we know it's important to our bottom line no matter what is happening in the federal government. So I still draw a lot of hope from the fact that I know some efforts are going to keep moving forward. Uh, and, you know, we may just be a little more reliant on some partners in the private sector, uh, in nonprofits, et cetera, over the next few years, but efforts will continue on uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. I'm, I'm sure of it. I think on that incredible positive note, we're going we're gonna to end. It's, it's 2 o'clock Eastern time now. Uh, and I wanted to thank Ariana again for a really, really terrific talk and for sharing all of her great knowledge and experience with us about about this important topic as it relates to uh, lands and coastal infrastructure. Um, just a reminder that all the talks from the webinar series uh, are posted on resilientinfrastructure.org under presentations, um, and Ariana's presentation will join that group uh, shortly, and, and those are then available on, on YouTube links that are posted there. And we continue the webinar series next semester, and we'll be uh, putting out those announcements in late December or early January. So I want to thank Ariana once again for a great talk, and thank all of you for attending today. Thank you. Yes, and, and thank you.